number two food systems with his advisor, President Josh Clark. Two tweets from Elijah Sam. Sam has taken only one indoor shower in the past two months. <laughs> Sam plays quarterback on the high school football team. And Sam hates twerking. It will not do it if you ask. There's a way to test. <laughs> So uh, this is a presentation I gave, or similar to a presentation I gave back in April at the Student Research Conference, and then I said it was preliminary thoughts on a dissertation, so now it must be somewhat less preliminary thoughts on a still evolving dissertation research idea. So um, yeah, unlike most of the people here, I haven't done any data collection or even much research design. So I'm looking for feedback from all you smart people. Um, so some premises. Um, first of all, you are what you eat isn't a metaphor. Your body makes itself from the food you eat and the water you drink and the air you breathe and other things you touch. Um, and human survival depends on regular food intake. And it's not a substitutable good as far as the economics go. And the other thing is we eat organisms like plants and animals and fungi. And those organisms come from ecosystems and um, those ecosystems co-involve with their non-living environments. And, in, and that co-evolution includes the humans in, that are co-evolving with the, with the animals that they eat. And um, that co-evolution will be important in the coming decades because of climate change where some of the external environment or the non-living environmental factors in ecosystems are going to be changing at a rapid rate it looks like um okay so now on to the more economic stuff food is a commodity in most of the world today more and more of the world today especially in industrialized countries like the united states um commodity means Commodities are fungible with other commodities in the same of the same type in the same market. So within a commodity market, like I'm gonna, like the global wheat commodity market, wheat is wheat is wheat is wheat is wheat is wheat. And there's another um, commodity market for organic wheat, which is a, a different product with with a different uh, definition of what wheat is. But within that all wheat's the same and it also is good for money at the the market price which within a market there's there's one prevailing price for these seemingly identical um, commodities and that's because if you think about it if you're a producer selling something that's considered the same as what all the other producers are selling and you try to sell it for more you can't because people will buy from the producers who are selling it for the market price. Same thing goes for the people buying things from markets. They have to pay the market price. And um, so wheat is wheat is wheat is the same as lu saying luxury wheat is sufficiency wheat. Markets don't know how to discriminate between um, the different uses of food. Um, so food is allocated toward those buyers who are willing and able to pay the market price. And commodity farmers receive the market price of foods, like I was talking about. And so because they can't sell their food for a different price, they can make money or for their livelihoods by minimizing costs and by producing more. So um, those costs are the, the other commodities that they must buy that are their factors of production. So if you're a farmer, minimizing cost means shifting your costs any producer in a commodity market, really, but we're talking about farmers. So shift means shifting the costs onto others. And, and this idea of cost shifting um, doesn't imply the intention to harm others. It's just the um, incentives that, insist, that exist in a market system where you want to shift your costs onto others so that you can have the difference between your costs and the market price be, be greater. And so that means relying on, th on resources that aren't traded in markets, and groundwater is one example, because it's hard, really hard to exclude people from taking groundwater that's under their property. So it gets depleted often because it's free. You can only charge for things that are excludable. Um, 
And a research was published in Nature earlier this year, actually, that 11% of global ground, groundwater depletion, that is groundwater that's, that's um, extracted at beyond its rate of regeneration, is traded in the international food trade. And often it's traded to places that actually have plenty of water and don't have to rely on depleting groundwater. So an example is like taking... A lot of the grains that are consumed here in Vermont by people and cattle are grown in places like Nebraska or Oklahoma, where they're draining the Ogallala Aquifer. So we're here in a quite water abundant region, draining water from places that are much that where water is much scarcer. Shoot, I need to hurry up a lot. So anyway, um, other ecosystem services on which agriculture relies because our food comes from ecosystem are similarly non-excludable and they're also what's called non-rival which means um, you benefiting from those ecosystem services not only can you not exclude people from the benefiting but everyone can benefit at the same time without keeping other people from benefiting so even if you did have a way to exclude people unlike with groundwater most ecosystem services like nutrient cycling and, and carbon uptake um, it, it would be silly to charge people for and to, and to ration them like that. Um, so anyway, what do you get? You get a global agri-food system that covers 40% of the Earth's surface and doesn't look like that. It looks more like that, feeding animals that live in places like that, which kind of looks like it, a tar sands extraction site was actually a bunch of those little white dots are cows that are fed um, grains. And global food systems release about a quarter of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions and account for two-thirds of total freshwater withdrawals and threaten biodiversity more than any other human activity. Um, enough plant calories are produced to feed about 10 billion people, but 45% um, of those calories and 60% of plant protein produced feed livestock, biofuel refineries, and other industrial processes another 25% of calories or 33% of food by weight is wasted and the food that's left over, including, which doesn't show up here, it will show up in a minute, the food that is recovered as edible food from those livestock um, is distributed really unequally according to people's purchasing power in the sense that three-tenths of the adults in the world are overweight, um, about one-tenth are obese, and 800 million people worldwide are chronically undernourished, even though there's enough plant calories produced to feed 10 billion, and there's only 7.5 billion people in the world. So a properly functioning, efficient market system with inequality like we have, and with a lot of the um, goods and services on which food production re relies being not commodities could actually reach this sort of outcome. Because um, when the price of food goes up, um, Poor people cut their consumption, rich people don't even notice. The price of bread is the same, whatever the commodity price of wheat is, because the commodity price of wheat is about one fifteenth of the price of bread in the United States, for example. So when global grain prices doubled in um, 2007, 2008, during the global financial crisis, um, an additional six point, or yeah, an additional 6.8% of the world's population, sorry, global undernourishment increased by 6.8%. An extra 40 million people became chronically undernourished in 2007, 2008 during that time. The United States at the time increased wheat consumption a little bit because it did, wasn't reflected on our food prices, this, this change. So um, a, a lot of the experts and academic experts suggest radically reducing economic inequality in one sense, which is only has happened historically during periods of really fast growth, which is kind of scary in a, in a um, situation where we're already surpassing or threatening to surpass global ecological limits, and has also happened in periods of huge destruction of wealth in wars and financial crises, which we can see possibly coming in the age of climate change, but are also really scary. And then the other market fix that's proposed is to incorporate environmental impacts into prices in artificial ways for things in the environment that can't be commodities easily. And that radically worsens economic inequality because it makes food more expensive if more of the environmental goods and services that food production relies on are either turned into commodities 
or um, incorporated into the price of food through government policy. Um, all that said, and, and we can think about why radically reducing economic inequality and incorporating the environment into prices hasn't happened yet, despite decades of environmental economists and other academics um, advocating that these are good policies for the justice and sustainability of humanity. And that's something that's been largely neglected in my field, ecological economics, and even more neglected in economics in general, and that is thinking about power, and that economic power is highly correlated to political power, and the United States has been studied thoroughly, but just the idea is that radically reducing economic inequality when there's low or no growth, which is the reality right now, and a lot of people are saying is what needs to continue to be the case in order to um, keep the, the physical size of the economy within global environmental limits. Um, that would mean, in, in, with no growth, radically reducing inequality would mean actually getting rich people to share their wealth with less rich people, which isn't super likely, considering they kind of hold the purse strings to make that reallocation as well. And incorporating the environment into prices also is really not in the interest of some of the most powerful actors in society, including corporations that sell fossil fuels, for example. Um, so what other options are there in terms of making food not a commodity or not a market good? Um, we can imagine centralized state-based food systems, which existed in the Soviet Union, and these, first of all, weren't very good because markets are really good, even though the only thing, the only information that travels with the good in a market is price. That still is a really important piece of information for allocating goods where they're most wanted. Obviously, it doesn't work when people don't have enough money to pay for the food that they need, but it's better than not having that signal. Um, and centralized state-based food systems tend to be really anti-democratic, and even if you had an ideal one, where, let's say, farmers were compensated for growing food with agroecological methods and it was distributed where it was needed most to human mouths first, that would be susceptible to regime change and it all going away because governments change hands often. I'm, I should wrap this up in a moment. Um, so another option that is becoming more and more feasible and because of information technology in our complex society and in less complex societies and smaller scale societies has always been the case are decentralized but planned food systems and that's what I'm interested in studying I think there's a really strong case that in addition to all the academic work um, devising the optimal policies for realizing social and environmental goals I think there's a strong case to be made especially in ecological economics to look at what we can do without government, without relying on the state to help us achieve our goals. So that's what I'm interested in studying. Um, there's a couple other people looking at it as well. These are the sort of free food networks. My One hypothesis that I have is that it, they're sort of segregated between people that are food secure and food insecure. And there's people studying this idea as food as a commons. But anyway, I'm more interested in your feedback than what I have to say about that. <laughs> Yeah, bar. Yeah, totally. Oh, here? Yeah. So you have like community gardens that are carrying dumpsters. Like, I'm curious where and if you see like interest in like networking and technologies or things that might allow for 
There's some cool apps going on in different cities in the U.S. that allow people who are interested in being food waste rescuers or recyclers and doing cool things with it to um, get information from restaurants and grocery stores and stuff like that. So that it's like like edible but not sellable food is a real big problem. Um, and those are cool. A lot of them have become have created food for markets in the sense that like the, the people using the technology are rescuing the food and making meals and selling it, which um, isn't, isn't a bad thing, but it's not what I'm interested in researching. Um, whereas I, a lot of the really cool innovation being done in, in the non-market non food is through face-to-face -face communication or so, sort of more old-fashioned ways of communicating, like physical message boards in communities and stuff like that. And a lot of that is because food insecure people often tend to have less access to communication technology as well, which isn't like a fundamental law. Like that could be changed too. <laughs> We're really, you're out of time, but make sure to find